2008. And I received a telephone call from um, the ranking Republican senator uh, from the state of Georgia. And um, he had read about my work. And at that time, I was very concerned with uh, the automobile industry and bankruptcy in general. And he said, would you be willing to testify in Congress? Hello and welcome to the BLK Podcast. My name is EOL Casadarge and I'm an equity research analyst at BLK. With me today is David and he will be introducing our guest. Um, as mentioned before, all the opinions mentioned in this podcast are of the analysts and the guests and not that of BLK or its respective sponsors. Sure. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Hi, my name is David Obwaya and I'm a junior at New York University. Uh, I currently serve as the Chief Investment Officer for the BLK Foundation, a foundation that helps Black businesses through grants and capital assistance. I also serve as the Chief Macro Officer for BLK Capital, and I was formerly the head of the T TMT portfolio. Today we have joining us Professor Altman, who is the Max L. Hine Professor of Finance at the Stern School of Business here at New York University. He's also the Director of Research in Credit and Debt Markets at the NYU Solomon Center for the study of financial institutions. Prior to serving in this position, Professor Altman chaired the Stern School's MBA program for 12 years. Altman was named one of the 100 most influential people in finance by the Treasury and Risk Management Magazine. Welcome, Mr. Altman. First of all, it's a great uh, pleasure to be uh, involved with uh, the Black uh, uh, Podcast Group and uh, uh, Black Capital Management. Um, uh, it's very important uh, that um, we work together, uh, and uh, I look forward to the discussion. Well, believe it or not, I uh, got first started as an um, interest in uh, bankruptcy prediction and credit risk in general. When I was a graduate student at UCLA, back, believe it or not, more than 50 years ago. Well, I guess if you see my face, you can believe it. Um, and uh, um, indeed, um, uh, if you look at the development of the z score family of models uh, timeline uh, on one of the slides that I have, uh, you'll see uh, that um, when I was at UCLA in the mid-1960s, um, it was a very fortuitous period to, for doing research in corporate finance although everybody was interested in growth theories, how to grow the company, how to assess growth among companies if you are an investment analyst. But I had read some books about the difficulties that companies have at times, and I was really more interested in the kind of the, um, uh, the dark side of finance. Uh, and I got interested in this at the same time that mainframe computers were available for the first time to do research in the social sciences on college campuses. Before that, if you wanted to do empirical research, you had to do it either with a handheld calculator, an abacus, but now the mainframe computer unleashed much more powerful techniques. At the same time, um, there were no real databases available for researchers then. So if you wanted to do empirical research, you had to build your own database. And that's what I decided to do with some help from um, some faculty members on the UCLA uh, faculty. At those days, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of punch cards, <laughs> but punch cards was the way you inputted data into the computer uh, the way it worked was you punched the data out after you gathered the data from, in my case, Moody's Industrial Manual or Standard & Poor Stock Guides. You put it on punch cards. You combine it with a source program that was the, in this case, discriminant analysis algorithm. Put it all together. Pick it up. It was very heavy, the boxes. 
So it was good for bodybuilding. And then you walked across campus and you delivered the box to the mother computer, the mainframe. And then you went to your favorite synagogue or uh, church or mosque and you prayed. You prayed that you got results. And in my case, it was about half the time that I got results. The other half, you know, you've heard of the hanging shards. The other time you punch data in the wrong column, in the wrong uh, uh, file, or you um, um, uh, some of the uh, punch cards get bent, and they would say, sorry, try again. Uh, but anyway, I was able to gather data from the Moody's Industrial Manual on a sample of bankrupt companies, all manufacturing at that time, and a control sample of non-bankrupts. Uh, same size, same industry category, um, same data uh, from dates. And the whole idea was to see if you can identify differences in profiles of healthy and unhealthy firms prior to the time that they defaulted. And then you run the model and you let the model choose the variables that you've selected beforehand, which ones were most predictive of financial distress. And I was very fortunate to build a model that was very accurate then. And remarkably, after more than 50 years, it's still quite accurate. Now, you may ask, how could that be? Haven't things changed in 50 years? And the answer is absolutely, they have changed. But some of the financial measures we used, and we'll take a look at the Z-score model, um, uh, seem to have defied the passage of time, but how you use it has changed. So if you go to the next slide, which is uh, slide eight uh, in the... Uh, the deck that I sent to you, you'll see the actual Z-score model. That's it. There are five variables that uh, out of about 25 that I uh, started with. Um, and those five variables, two of them were particularly new at the time. Altogether, they measure liquidity of the company, cumulative profitability, current earnings, the market equity relative to the book value of total liabilities, and uh, an activity ratio of sales to total assets. The weighting factors that you see on this slide were determined by the computer, not by me. My job was to assemble a good sample Choose variables that could be predictive and let the computer decide which set of variables and which weightings should be chosen. Two of those variables were different and had never been in the literature at that time. The second variable, retained earnings to total assets, which is a measure of cumulative profitability um, minus any dividend payout over the life of the company divided by the assets. And the fourth variable, the market equity relative to the book liabilities. It was the first time in empirical finance that a market value of equity was used in a more credit uh, application. And out came an equation that you see. And if you go to the next slide, I'll show you how we... Um, uh, articulated our results for some sort of meaningful um, uh, application and identification of financial distress. The next slide shows you the zone of discrimination. Back in 1965-66, when I was doing the research, these uh, zones proved to be perfectly uh, accurate. 100% accurate if the score was above 2.99 and 100% accurate for predicting distress, that is bankruptcy within two years, if the score was below 1.8. And I published this 
When I became an uh, assistant professor at NYU, we weren't called Stern at that time, uh, I published an article in the Journal of Finance, and I knew that the reader would need some guidance. And so I chose these cutoff scores, if you will, or boundaries. Well, <clears throat> it worked then, and it doesn't work anymore very well. And I'll explain why in a moment. But I was very lucky that the practitioners, as well as the academics, picked up this model and began using it themselves. Now, let me um, try to uh, be as mm, accurate as I can to explain why I think the model is still around after 50 years. That's it. The first reason is it's pretty simple. You saw the five variables not very difficult to calculate, not difficult to multiply by the weighting factor and add it all up. <clears throat> Second, it's surprising to a lot of people, still quite accurate. Back then it was about 95% accurate to predict bankruptcy within two years. And over the years, it's still maybe 80% accurate or 85. And the third reason, and maybe the most important, it's free. You don't have to pay for it. <laughs> and it's as a result, it appears in textbooks. It appears in um, uh, software programs. You know, you can go on, uh, on Bloomberg and get it. You can uh, Google it. You can get it. Wikipedia, whatever. And, you know, you'll try something if it looks interesting and it's free. If you got to pay a lot of money, it's obviously got to prove its merit on a, uh, a cost basis. But otherwise, you try it, and it turns out it uh, has worked pretty well. So that was the beginning. And I think also among the reasons why it is still, and this may be a little exaggeration, but I don't think so, uh, probably the most used financial metric for predicting financial distress of companies. Wow. So yeah. Professor Altman, that was fantastic. That was a great overview of the Z score and, and just an overview of how you got into the industry. It was definitely great hearing about your story that um, in the beginning of empirical research at, at, at UCLA. Um, but before we get deeper into the Z score, um, and, and certainly it's impressive that it's stood the test of time. Um, can you tell us maybe a little more about what it was like to actually be in empirical research back when you were getting started in the late 1960s at UCLA? Yeah, well, I can, I can try. Um, as I said before, um, uh, the holy grail in most research in the corporate finance area was concentrating on uh, uh, different uh, techniques for achieving positive growth, uh, whether it be financial or marketing or management, um, and um, uh, as a result, most empirical uh, data was not looking at the past so much, but looking at uh, potentially uh, growth uh, theories for the future. Um, and so it was quite difficult to uh, do meaningful empirical research as a result. Yeah, people tried. Um, I was a graduate student, and I worked for a very famous uh, corporate finance professor, and he wrote a best-selling textbook. Uh, and when I told him that I was interested in uh, this, he said, well, why don't you do some case studies to first understand the bankruptcy process? And I did. Uh, and at that time, it was called Chapter 10 rather than Chapter 11, which we now call it. Uh, and... Um, uh, uh, he, he gave me a bunch of uh, old textbooks concentrating on the Great Depression. And he said, read about what can happen to companies in difficult times. You'll learn more about uh, finance than if you read these um, uh, new textbooks about how to grow. And I did. Uh, I, I didn't like case studies too much. Uh, uh, but I, I said, you know, I wonder if you can 
you know, based on just financial data, predict financial success of a company or financial distress. Uh, and he said, yeah, it'll never work. It'll never work. I said, well, why don't I try it and see what happens? Uh, and then we'll discuss it. And he said, OK, go ahead. And by the way, there's a new young professor here who's done some work using this uh, statistical software program called discriminant analysis, which is like regression analysis, which you, um, most students coming out of business schools know. Discriminant's a little different. But anyway, try it. Uh, but it's basically the same. You come up with an equation, and then you look for prediction of the dependent variable in the equation. And the dependent variable is qualitative in nature, bankrupt or non-bankrupt, uh, success or non-success, uh, maybe the bond rate you're trying to predict of a company, or uh, the earnings per share of a company. Uh, then you would use regression. Anyway, what it was like, it was um, it was the right time. I was in the right time at the right place because, as I said, now you had the computer power to analyze data. We didn't call it big data then. We didn't call it data analytics. We simply called it data. Uh, and um, uh, it, it was the right time to do it. And, you know, sometimes you don't have to be really brilliant to have breakthroughs, but you got to be first. And I was very lucky to be first to concentrate on data, on bankruptcy, and having the use of computers and uh, software programs that were now available. Uh, five years earlier, or three years earlier, I wouldn't have had the computer power. Three years later, someone else would have done it, in my opinion. Because in retrospect, it was quite interesting and uh, obvious of, of the way to go. Now, let me point out one thing uh, more, David, uh, if I can yell as well. <clears throat> Things have changed, obviously, in 50 years. And if you go to the next slide, I'll show you how you adjust that Z-score model for current situation. Uh, uh, look at the um, uh, slide called Time Series Impact on Corporate Credit Scores. Um, and um, you'll see that there's been a huge migration in credit risk over the last 50 plus years. First of all, and this year is the crowning example of it, there's greater use of corporate leverage compared to any year we've known before. You know, back then there was no such thing as high yield junk bonds or leverage loans or really anything beyond bank financing to raise money from the debt markets. Also, there was very little global competition back then. So, in other words, um, it was um, more difficult to get a global product, but it was not, not the kind of global um, competition that could drive you out of business. And so, there weren't that many bankrupt companies then. There was not much leverage. There was not much competition outside of uh, the United States. Uh, and things have changed. Now, lots of leverage, more and larger bankruptcies. Take a guess, last year, 2020, and I'll tell you, uh, you know, what it is normally, but take a guess how many companies in the United States went bankrupt with more than 100 million in liabilities. How many? 10, 50, 100, 1,000? I would guess somewhere around 2,000. Yo, you probably have a better guess than that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe 1,000, 1,500? No, well, you guys are, uh, I love you guys because that would give me more data to build new models. But no, there was about 180 over a hundred million dollars. Uh, and there were uh, 60 companies, six zero, that had liabilities greater than $1 billion. Wow. Yeah, to, wow. to put this into perspective, 
you almost never find a billion dollar company going bankrupt in any other country but the United States. And the reason is, if you're so big, you're usually protected in some way by the government because they don't want to see too many people lose their jobs. And so there's a lot of zombies out there. And that's a subject perhaps for another podcast, uh, new research on zombieism on a global level. Let me just conclude on zombieism, by the way, that there's an increasing trend in companies that are artificially being kept alive. Uh, and we have some different metrics for measuring it, uh, including in the United States. So uh, to get back to why I think you, you need to uh, adjust the Z-score model for practical decision-making. Um, one other question, and you guys might know it. I don't know how many people out there li who will listen will know it. How many AAA firms, the most creditworthy companies, how many are still existing in the United States? AAA companies. I would have to guess maybe a handful, five, five to ten. Okay, that's a good guess. The answer is two. Two. Microsoft and Johnson & Johnson. Wow. Uh, if you look at the next slide, you'll see the time series of AAA companies in the United States. So back in around 1992, there were uh, 98 or 99. <clears throat> Today, there are two. So why do you think there are only two AAAs left? Is it because, <clears throat> um, you know, uh, companies no longer want to be AAA or uh, companies um, um, uh, have problems over the years? Well, the answer is both of that, uh, I think. First of all, it's very hard to be a AAA company if you've got a lot of debt on the balance sheet. <clears throat> and debt, by the way, can be used very efficiently, as you probably know, to increase the earnings per share of the company, increase the return on equity. But it's a two-edged sword, and of course... <clears throat> Too much debt could cause a lot of <clears throat> financial distress. And the other reason is companies don't want to be AAA anymore. They don't want to be AA. Uh, maybe financial institutions do. By the way, there are no banks in the world, no banks that are AAA today, zero. Uh, and, you know, there used to be a lot of them. But the main reason is, I believe, is that corporate America in particular understands that leverage can be used very effectively and they also see how cheap it is to borrow money especially in current times and so to in my opinion the preferred rating class of corporate america are triple b's not triple a not double a not a but triple b and i think the reason is it's still investment grade the rating agencies are known not to uh, drop a company to non-investment grade or junk unless it's very serious. They're usually very slow to do it. And it takes them more time to do it than what a model would, would predict. Anyway, the bottom line is the Z-scores, cutoff scores that I showed you before are no longer appropriate. And if you go to the next slide, um, uh, and I'll show you how to adjust that. Uh, so go to um, slide number um, 13. Yeah. So uh, this slide shows you what I call bond rating equivalents. And that is we take a sample of companies at the various rating classes we have to combine AAA with AA. This is on the left. And every couple of years, I have my graduate assistants uh, recalibrate this. So you look at the median, the 50 percentile company, of each rating class, what its Z-score is. And notice that the D at the very bottom, the default rating class, had an average Z-score of about zero. And this has been true for about 20 years. 
So now what I caution investors is that no longer is 1.8 the appropriate cutoff score for anything below it in distress, but it should be around zero. Indeed, a B-rated company or a high triple C uh, may have a score on average below 1.8, and they don't all go bankrupt. But below zero, you're really into the real distress zone. And then, in 1989, I developed a new model called the mortality rate approach. And here's where someone with an actuarial science background can understand very well. If you know the characteristics of a, say, person, when they are born, where they're born, their economic strata, um, you know, whether they're a, a male or female, you can have a pretty good estimate of the expected uh, life, the mortality of the person. Well, there are no boy bonds or girl bonds, but they're gorgeous triple A's, good looking double A's, handsome A's, etc. Then there's kind of disgusting triple C's. And we can use that categorization to estimate PDs. So the first step is, let me summarize. Calculate the Z-score. Second, assign a bond rating equivalent. What you think, based on the model, the firm's bond rating should be, not what the rating agencies are saying. And then look up the mortality table, just like you look up the mortality table of people. So if you go another four slides, I'll show you a matrix that can be used by you as an analyst. Some of you are analysts on equities. Yeah, go to the mortality rate table. Uh, so it's uh, one, two, three more. And we looked at data. This one happened to be uh, from 1971, 2019, every bond that was issued. And I can go into that table and see, given its bond rating at birth, when it came into the world, uh, not that slide, uh, you know, um, go back one. Mm. Go back two, actually. I'm sorry, the other way. Yeah, keep going. Go back. Uh, stop. Okay. Um, the That's the uh, mortality loss. One more slide back. Yeah, mortality rating. That table, that matrix... So if a company is uh, like a B-rated at birth, by the fifth year, about 28% of B-rated bonds have defaulted over the last 50 plus years. Now, 28% sounds like a large number. But if you factor in the fact that when you're B or triple C, you get very high coupons relative to the average and you compound the interest on that, you'll find that the uh, return on a B-rated portfolio can be quite attractive relative to the risk. And what is the risk? The risk is that the firm defaults and you lose money. Well, how much money do you lose? The next slide will show you the mortality loss. And I can tell you on average over the last 50 years, if you um, uh, uh, bought a portfolio of Bs, you would have lost about 20% of your money by the fifth year due to defaults. But you would have earned about 2.5% per year more than treasuries from the coupons on the portfolio that doesn't default. Net, 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 you're going to be way out of the game than if you invested in um, uh, uh, low, uh, low rated uh, bonds. Excuse me, Mr. Okay. Yeah, right. Uh, my video was gone. Yeah. Okay, let, let's move on to your next question. Yeah, well, I, I mean, that was a great overview of how you got into the empirical research of industry with finance. Um, and, and certainly it's night and day, the differences, that even after they add 
of the high yield issuances. Definitely. Um, we'd like to know, um, I guess, the, like, how you see the credit markets moving forward. And yeah. how you your, your outlook for the credit markets. That's an important question. So here's my concern, fellas. Even before COVID-19, we have noticed a big increase in corporate debt as a percentage of GDP globally, not only in the United States. And then we had the pandemic. And the pandemic caused a tremendous adjustment. We went from a nine credit cycle to a stress cycle within a few weeks. It was incredible in March of 2020. The Federal Reserve and the Congress moved very quickly to support the economy. Interest rates were dropped to basically zero. Um, uh, secondary purchases in the market of uh, government bonds to support the government bonds, uh, of corporate debt to support companies. Never before did the central bank buy corporate debt to support that market. But they felt it was necessary. And it worked really fast. And things turned around in the equity markets, as you know. You know, in March of 2020, the equity markets went down more than 30%. By the end of the year, we were up 10 to 15%. And it's continuing, although the last week has been a little um, uh, touchy. Now, what also happened is the markets were emboldened to issue more debt rather than less debt, which is usually what takes place in a crisis. In a crisis, usually you deleverage. This was the first time, and I've been studying credit markets for a long time, that I saw that the markets went just the opposite. So here's my concern about credit markets going forward. You've heard of the term unintended consequences. Well, in this case, you had the government support. You had central bank support, not just in the U.S., but certainly uh, led by the U.S. You also had um, uh, investors looking for yield because the yields were so low. So how do you get yield? You take more risk. So my concern now, and by the way, the amount of junk bonds issued in 2020 was $430 billion in the U.S. And so far this year, it's running at about a $600 billion clip. That is several hundred billion dollars more than any year we've observed. Same sort of phenomena for leveraged loans. Uh, leveraged buyouts are going through the roof in terms of what they're paying for the company uh, and the amount of debt that's being raised. So here's my concern about credit markets going forward. I feel that when we have the next downturn, and I don't know when that will be, and I don't know the catalyst, but it's usually something we don't expect rather than something we expect. Because if we expect it, we will discount it. But if we don't expect it, like the pandemic or like uh, the mortgage crisis back in uh, 2008, 2009, um, which started before, or um, uh, a leveraged buyout, um, complete uh, um, um, uh, blowing up. If this happens, the fact that it happens when there's so much debt outstanding will mean that the consequences for corporate America and other countries, look what's going on in Europe right now. Many countries in Europe where uh, you are in the UK and where other people are in Germany or France or Italy or many other countries, there's been a moratorium on interest rates. You know, it's almost illegal to go bankrupt in some countries. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so there's this kind of pent up demand for when those supports are removed 
which is probably going to be by the end of this year, if not sooner, then you're going to find a lot of those companies, which are no longer being supported by the government, are going to go bankrupt. So my concern is uh, when we have a downturn, and of course, this year will be spectacular GDP growth, probably around 7%. When's the last time we saw 7%? I don't, not in my lifetime, <laughs> yeah. uh, believe it or not. I've been living a long time. Uh, or maybe there was, but I was too young to understand it. But the point I want to make is that on the backs of so much leverage, which has been promulgated by the low interest rates, which has been promulgated by government support, where could we could be into a very serious uh, financial crisis once again. The good news is the banks are uh, much better um, uh, capitalized, and so they can support more uh, non-performing loans. And here's my silver lining, if you will. I think companies now, don't wait, should start raising equity capital to try to reduce the debt or use the excess funds that they raised from the debt markets to pay down the debt now. Because now's the time to do it when the cost of debt is low and when equities are high. Don't wait for the downturn because then the cost of equity capital will go up. Uh, And so uh, credit markets are a great companion to equity markets. But you have to understand the correlations between the two. And, um, you know, when I was a graduate student, I was taught a theory in corporate finance called the opportunistic theory. And that means take advantage of low interest rates or high equity prices to raise capital. Okay, that makes sense. But the point is, there is a target capital structure that companies have, and they still know that. Get back to your target when it's possible. And don't wait for the crisis because you won't be able to get back. So anyway, I'm beginning to see companies realizing that, not in great amounts, except for these SPACs that we can talk about another time. But I think now is the time for those um, companies that loaded up on debt to start issuing equity to reduce that equity, uh, that bankruptcy risk when they can. And don't wait for the next economic downturn, because I know there's going to be a spike in default rates. Totally. I think um, to actually um, echo your point there, um, as students, we've been watching very closely companies who are stressed and even defaulted in the case of Hertz and AMC. Um, yeah. Exactly what you suggested, using that debt to pay off their equity or raise equity capital. Yeah, that's right. AMC is a, a very good example, of, um, and it's very hard to do for a distressed company like AMC. And by the way, they were distressed even before the pandemic, um, but not as much as during it, of course. But they have had a very good run, somewhat helped out by the uh, the Reddit uh, phenomena and uh, uh, the uh, small investors, uh, um, you know, getting together and saying, "Hey, let's let's buy this company's uh, equity," and you know, through chat boxes or whatever, uh, a new type of equity research, uh, I might add. <laughs> and um, uh, anyway, it, it uh, ballooned the equity price, and the company is very smart to take advantage of that to raise equity when they can. Uh, but they were able to raise debt, too, in this period. This is the remarkable thing about what happened in the pandemic. Companies like AMC, which suffered, you know, because uh, obviously people didn't go to the movies anymore. Um, and uh, there are a lot of other examples of that. Uh, can now take advantage of the fact that the uh, op- outlook is very positive for our earnings and equity prices. Um, there is the specter of inflation out there, so be careful of that. Uh, we could talk about that another time, too. But in the short time remaining, I'm wondering if you might be interested in what I would consider my most memorable application of the Z-score model. Yes. Good. Most well, let me take you back 
to 2008. Um, and um, I was um, at a conference in uh, Florida, actually. And it was a Monday. Uh, I think it was December 2nd, uh, 2008. And I received a telephone call from um, the ranking Republican senator uh, from the state of Georgia. And um, he had read about my work. And at that time, I was very concerned with uh, the automobile industry and bankruptcy in general. And he said, would you be willing to testify in Congress? And I said, well, what are you going to be discussing? And he said, whether the government should bail out General Motors, Chrysler, and maybe Ford. Uh, as you may know, you're both pretty young, so you didn't live through it that you remember. But in 2008, um, uh, the entire U.S. automobile industry was in crisis. Uh, and for a short time before that, uh, there were bailout money for uh, the big uh, two. And uh, Ford uh, was not on the uh, bankruptcy list, but it was beginning to deteriorate quite a bit. And I said, uh, oh, so you want me to talk about GM, whether the government should support General Motors? And they said, yes. Uh, I said, well, how much time do I have to prepare my testimony? They said, uh, you have until Friday. <laughs> this was Monday. Uh, and I said, well, I'm at a conference. I don't have any time to really do the analytics, but I have looked at GM. Do you mind if I call my graduate assistant and get the latest Z-score on GM? So if you go uh, you know, to the next uh, slide in the, the, or the um, one of the last slides in the slide deck uh, that I sent to you, uh, you'll see a timeline of Z-scores for General Motors. Um, so go to, let's see, um, yeah, uh, Z-score, uh, financial applications, and then the Z-score model applied. Uh, slide 31, uh, 21 and uh, uh, 22. So 21, this is a list that you might be interested in. And uh, you can show it to your listeners. It's a list of applications of the Z-score model that I've learned about oh, and studied somewhat uh, over the years. Many of them were pointed out to me as possible applications by practitioners. Some of them are quite obvious. To be used in lending. To be used for bond investing. But both of you are uh, interested in common stocks, I believe. You can build a long, short investment strategy based on the Z-score. The responsibility to decide on whether to file for bankruptcy or not is the responsibility of the board of directors. However, they certainly uh, use uh, consultants and advisors to advise them, like bankruptcy lawyers or like bankers or like um, credit analysts. Uh, and once, and how do you make that decision? Well, here was the case of General Motors in 2008. Go to the next slide. And you'll see a timeline of the Z-score and the bond rating equivalents. So back in 2005, the Z-score was around one, which on a bond rating equivalent was like triple C plus. And it stayed that way. But believe it or not, back in 2005, General Motors was rated triple B, the lowest but still investment grade. When I asked my graduate assistant on December 2nd, 2008, to calculate the latest Z-score, the results were a very significant negative Z-score. And then you can see that down there. It was almost, uh, I think it was a negative 0.6, 
but uh, maybe when he uh, did it, it was a little higher than that, but still very negative. So I was quite convinced that the only way to save General Motors was for General Motors to go bankrupt. And I told that to Congress. Congress did not like me at all. I wasn't exactly booed, but the way it works in uh, congressional testimony, and I did it before the House Finance Committee, not the, not the uh, Senate, was you give up your testimony, but you only have five minutes. And after five minutes, they cut you off and they ask questions. And they could ask questions for hours. Well, in my case, they asked a lot of questions. And I was the only one on the panel that was talking about whether GM should be bailed out to say, no, they should not be. They should be motivated to go bankrupt because there are great mechanism to restructure under Chapter 11 and come out as a going concern. You can do a lot of things in bankruptcy that you can't do out of bankruptcy, like get new financing called debtor in possession financing. Uh, and uh, banks and other institutions like to lend to you because uh, a restructured company has a very, uh, if it's restructured well, has a very high likelihood of repaying their loans. Anyway, they didn't like me and they voted against what I recommended. Uh, and every other person who um, uh, testified said, no, no, we can't afford a General Motors bankruptcy. It's an American icon. Uh, too many people will lose their jobs. Uh, we don't want to give a signal during the, uh, the uh, su significant recession that even the biggest companies can go bankrupt. No, don't, uh, don't go bankrupt. We'll bail you out again. Uh, but the, the Senate voted against bailing out for technical conservative reasons. And George Bush, who was the president at that time, said just before he left office, because he had lost the election, uh, uh, to Obama, where he didn't run his um, uh, the Republicans lost the election to Obama. He said, I'm going to bail out GM one more time. And now it's Obama's problem. And it was. And he did a great job. He appointed a commission. He tried to help the company. But guess what? It didn't work. On June 1st, 2009, Probably the happiest day in my professional life, General Motors filed for bankruptcy. I was so happy. I think I was drunk for a week. <laughs> and uh, uh, huh. <laughs> you laugh. <laughs> because I thought that that was the only way to save the company. And I think I was right. Because since then, the company has restructured. It sold a lot of assets, got rid of uh, a lot of uh, unprofitable, uh, you remember the Pontiac, or you may not remember, but there's something called yeah. Pontiac uh, mm -hmm. cars, uh, and they get rid of some other, uh, certainly a lot of factories. And also, they borrowed, and this is what I recommended in testimony, $50 billion from the U.S. government in the so-called debtor-in-possession financing. And debtor-in-possession financing during bankruptcy gives the lender a super priority status over all existing uh, unsecured debt. And as a result, the government got all their money back. GM is now a very profitable, healthy going concern, not as healthy as the market seem to believe, because I still think they have too much debt, but um, you know, uh, they are a going concern. And I, I sincerely believe this, some people may disagree, that the only reason GM is alive today is because they went bankrupt. And I can say the same thing about Delta Airlines, American Airlines. Just about every major airline in the United States has gone bankrupt at least once. The only one major airline that hasn't is Southwest. Every other one, every other one, United Airlines, uh, 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 the old TWA, uh, which is now part of American, 
Yeah. Um, some of them have gone ways. bankrupt twice or three times. Yeah. Anyway, that was an application of the Z model. And it gave me the confidence to say a bailout, giving mm -hmm. them money, is not going to do it. They've got to make major changes. And the only way to force those changes in many cases, not all, but in many cases, is through the bankruptcy process. Yeah. And there are many other applications, but I, I kind of like that story. No, yeah, well, no. that was a story and, and definitely a, a great example of the actual utility of this model. Um, I personally wish they would have listened and, and that initial Congress meeting would have spared everybody with initial. Well, you, you can listen. It's on YouTube. Okay. I'll actually go back, we'll go back to December 5th. The, 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 the rest was December 5th, 2008, mm -hmm. and it was on uh, the restructuring of the, uh, or not, of the um, um, uh, autom U.S. automobile industry. Uh, it may be hard to find right now, but uh, you can do it at your leisure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll we'll find it. Uh, but that, no, that's such a great experience that you shared with us as well. Um, you testifying sure. at, at the House of Representatives. You know, thank you so much just for taking the time and you know educating us and our community. You know, this this episode especially is like I think something we'll definitely value and cherish for a long time. So thank you so much. You're welcome, and David. By the way. Um, uh, you can maybe audit my class or take it for credit as an undergraduate, although it's mainly a graduate class on bankruptcy and reorganization. Well, that is an area of interest of mine, so I'd love to take that class. We well, okay, great. I teach it every fall, and um, uh, it's uh, every so often I get an undergraduate. It's mainly a uh, uh, graduate. Thank you so much again. I hope uh, uh, your listeners enjoy it and. Uh, Good luck to your great organization. I'd love to keep in touch. Thank you.